So uh, I've been working with Andrew Appel at Princeton and Alexi Nogan at HRL Labs on verifying some software that's used in automated vehicles. So in an automated vehicle, uh, we may have some collection of sensor systems, uh, like the tire pressure gauge and the pedal, and some uh, set of control systems, like the entertainment system and the engine controller. Uh, and we need the control systems to constantly get up-to-date values from the sensors. Uh, at the same time, some of these sensors and control systems are safety critical, like the pedal or the engine controller. Uh, and some of them aren't as critical, like the tire pressure gauge and the entertainment system. And so we want a system where we can guarantee that the good sensors can always successfully communicate with good components, even if the unver untrusted and possibly unverified components uh, have some problem with them. So the solution we came up with is a system of message buffers, uh, where we decompose the whole system into a collection of single writer multiple reader systems uh, that use the buffers, where the writers use the buffers to communicate values to the readers. So an individual uh, one of these systems uh, looks something like this. So we have a collection of location buffers, one for each reader, and a collection of data buffers, two more than the number of readers. The writer will use the data buffers to store uh, each new value, and the readers use the location buffers to learn which uh, data buffer holds the most recent data. So when the, a writer wants to write some new data, it first calls the start write function, uh, which allows it to compute a data buffer that isn't currently in use by any reader. It then uh, non-atomically writes some arbitrarily large data to that buffer. And then it calls the finish write function, uh, which causes it to use an atomic uh, exchange operation to publish the location of the newest data. Then when a reader wants to read a value, it does another atomic exchange operation on its own location buffer, and simultaneously gets the location of the newest data, as well as replacing it with an acknowledgment si uh, signal, empty. And then it can go and read the data from the newest location, once again with non-atomic operations. If the reader happens to run much more quickly than the writer, it will read its own acknowledgment signal again, and just go back to reading the value that it's already read. But now, if the writer wants to write again, first, it will uh, once again call start write and pick out a data buffer that isn't being used by any reader. Uh, and then uh, call finish write and publish the, look, the most recently written location. But when it does this, it'll simultaneously collect that empty, that uh, red signal, and update its own internal list of which buffers have been received by which readers. And because uh, the writer maintains this list, the start write function, where it picks out a uh, buffer to write to, a data buffer to write to, uh, will, doesn't actually need to do any synchronization. So the only synchronizing operations uh, in this entire system are the atomic exchanges that the readers and the writer do to the location buffers. Uh, so uh, to sum that up, uh, we break the uh, sensor controller systems into a collection of single reader, multiple writer, uh, single writer, multiple reader systems uh, with, if they're n readers, they're n location buffers and n plus two data buffers. We provide these key function, these four core functions uh, for the reader and writer to call, and then uh, each of the start functions returns the index of some data buffer that the reader or writer can then access with completely ordinary non-atomic memory accesses. The only synchronization between threads comes when uh, with the finish write and the start read function where the threads have to figure out what the latest, have to uh, publish or receive what the latest location is. And so uh, once we designed this system, uh, we used the verified software toolchain, a system for proving separation logic uh, specifications of C programs in COC uh, to prove correctness of the system with good components and then provided a pencil and paper argument for why the system is safe even when some of the components may be buggy or malicious. Uh, so first, I'll talk about how we proved the system correct with good components. Here's some of the example, 
uh, code from the uh, core functions that we provide, the start read function. Uh, so you can see a reader, when it wants to read, first does that atomic exchange operation on its location buffer, getting a new buffer to read. Um, if what it receives is actually a data buffer index, then it records it. Otherwise, it just goes back to reading whichever index it had most recently received. So this is the case we expect to hit when uh, the reader runs faster than the writer and reads its own empty. Uh, and then it returns that index, whether it's the newly received index or the old index. Uh, and most of this is pretty standard C that we can reason about with pretty standard separation logic. Um, the one new interesting bit is that atomic exchange instruction. Uh, so if we were going to write a separation logic specification for this function, uh, we might write something like this, where we say the reader has its local uh, variables reading in last read. Uh, as well as ownership of some data buffer B0 to start. Once it's done, it should own data buffer B, uh, the new one that it's learned instead. Uh, but somehow this communication has to take effect by via the atomic exchange operation, where it gives up uh, partial access to whichever buffer it's no longer reading and gains access to the new buffer it's reading instead. Uh, so to talk about how we reason about atomic exchange in VST, I'll need to start by talking about the concurrent separation logic that VST uses. Uh, so this is a pretty standard concurrent separation logic with locks. Uh, so our pre we have a predicate uh, which says that L is a memory location that's a lock with resource invariant R, where R is an arbitrary separation logic formula describing the resources held by the lock. Then when a program does a lock acquire operation, it gets access to the resources held by the lock and can read and modify them arbitrarily, as long as by the time it calls the release operation, it's reestablished that invariant R, and then after releasing the lock, it no longer has access to it. So an atomic exchange operation is uh, pretty similar to this, but it has a couple of significant differences. Uh, first of all, uh, a lock, when we hold it, we have access to the invariant. It, the only states it can be in are locked or unlocked. The location that we're doing atomic exchange on, on the other hand, holds a value, and the resources it holds can depend on that value. The second, uh, the second wrinkle, and the one that makes this a bit more complicated, is that atomic exchange happens instantaneously. There's no intermediate state in which the program has access to the invariant. It gains access to the invariant, makes modifications, and gives it up all in a single step. And so the rule that we end up with for atomic exchange looks something like this. We have an atomic exchange assertion, just like the lock assertion, saying that a location X is an atomic exchange location with invariant R. But now that R is parameterized by the value that's held in the location. Uh, and then the precondition here asserts that we can do pretty much any kind of uh, exchange of resources that would be justified if we acquired, made a change, and released in one step. So if we have some, so we, if we have some precondition P and the exchange invariant is R, uh, we can get back any Q after the exchange as long as the precondition P in combination with the invariant on the original value of X implies the postcondition Q along with the invariant on the new value of X. To make that more concrete, let's look at an example. So uh, in, the, uh, in the example of the messaging system where we want to exchange ownership of buffers via a location, you might say, well, let's assume that the atomic exchange location is going to hold the index of some buffer, and then the associated invariant is ownership of that buffer. So if uh, the atomic exchange location x points to an integer i, then the associated resource is ownership of data buffer index i. Now, let's say we're some, up, some thread that, want, that holds already uh, ownership of some other data buffer J, and we want to exchange that J for whatever is in X. So this rule um, says that the way we can do that is we start by opening up the invariant and combining it with our precondition. And then we know that after the operation, uh, X will point to some new value J, and we need to reestablish the invariant R on that new value. So in this example, we need to reprovide, we need to provide now ownership of data buffer J. And then what post condition can we have for this? It's just whatever resources are left. 
So ownership of the original data buffer i that was previously held by x. And so uh, that's how we can use a role like this to exchange ownership of data buffers uh, via an atomic exchange operation that just switches values. And the actual uh, rule that we end up using in verification is just a slight amendment of this to also include a history of the operations performed on the location. And we'll see in just a second why that's useful. So here's a slightly simplified version of the specification that we actually proved for the start read function. We have, once again, the local uh, variables, reading and start read, that the reader owns. We have the atomic exchange invariant on the location buffer that corresponds to that reader, uh, which here we can see has both the invariant and some information about the history of operations performed. And then the rest of the specification says that the reader starts with some partial ownership pi of data buffer B0, whichever it read most recently, which is also the latest buffer written in that history. And after we perform the operation, we now have some, we return that value B, that B is the index of the data buffer that we now have access to, and that's now the latest uh, value written in an updated history that's recorded any new writes that may have occurred. Uh, so we can use this specification to make concrete the assertion that uh, whatever uh, buffer is returned from the start read function, the reader has access to, has read access to that location, and it's the latest value written by the writer as of the atomic exchange operation. Uh, so the one tricky bit here uh, is what actually is that R? What's the invariant that we're going to use to govern the movement of uh, data buffers between the reader and the writer? The invariant we use is pretty similar to the uh, one I gave in the example, but it's a little bit more complicated uh, because there are actually two different cases. There's the case where there's some message from the writer that, the, that it's waiting for the reader to receive, and in that case, uh, just as we saw in the example, uh, the invariant holds some share of data buffer B, where B is the value that the writer has just published. Uh, on the other hand, we also have the case where the reader has already received a buffer and wrote the empty value. In this case, uh, the associated resource is one that we have to calculate from the history. It's whatever buffer that reader previously received. And to see why this needs to be the case, um, it's because the reader needs to return whichever buffer it had previously whenever it reads a new buffer. And the writer needs to recollect that share of the buffer so that it can have full ownership of a location and be able to write to that location again. So it can reuse any location, any uh, index in the data buffer array, as long as it's recollected all the shares and can calculate that no reader is currently using that location. So once we've come up with this, in, this communication invariant and used the atomic exchange rule, uh, it wasn't too difficult, although it was a number of thousands of lines of cock, to prove that uh, when all of the components are good, we can successfully communicate, and readers always receive the most recent value. How about when not all components are good? Uh, so uh, let's take another look at this diagram, and first consider the case where one of the readers is malicious. Uh, so the way that we limit the negative effects that a reader can have is through virtual memory protections. The readers have read access to each of the data buffers and read-write access to their location buffer. And the writer has read-write access to all of these buffers, but not to the buffers and any other system. So if a reader is malicious, what can it do? It can write garbage data to its own location buffer, and that's all, because that's all it has write access to. So uh, this means that the worst it can do is refuse to give up the share of whatever uh, buffer it's currently reading. But that's fine. Uh, because we have n plus 2 uh, data buffers, if one of the readers just stops giving useful feedback, we continue with one fewer reader and one fewer data buffer, and all the invariants of the system still hold. On the other hand, uh, what if, one of the writer, if the writer is malicious? Then it has uh, right access to all of these buffers, so it can put garbage in all of them. Uh, but Importantly, it can't interfere with the reader's ability to receive 
up-to-date data from other writers. Um, and uh, that's for two reasons. First, uh, it doesn't have write access to the buffers of any other instance of the messaging system. And second, it can't force the readers to block. So crucially, because we only use atomic exchange operations for synchronization, there's nothing that a writer can do to force readers to just sit and wait for any kind of feedback. They can still continue running and continue getting useful data from any other writers that might be in the system. Right. Uh, and so uh, to wrap up, uh, in the paper, we've presented a high assurance uh, single writer, multiple readers messaging system uh, with completely non-blocking communication. Uh, we've proved using VST and Coq that if all the components in the system are good, then the readers always get newest data from the writer. Uh, and we've sketched a proof that if we have bad components, whether buggy or malicious, they can't interfere with the ability of good components to communicate. Uh, in the process, we extended the separation logic used in VST with an atomic, a rule for atomic exchange operations, uh, which we provided as an axiom, but also verified with a lock-based implementation. Uh, and the system that we came up with is actually being used in autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we did some tests and measured that the communication ever overhead is pretty acceptable. We only have those atomic exchange operations done when new data is published, after all. Uh, and a red team wasn't able to find security flaws in the system. Uh, so I'd like to wrap up with mentioning just a couple of extensions that we're now working on. Um, the first is uh, that safety proof that I just gave is just pencil and paper. We'd like to be able to actually formally prove that the system is safe with bad components. And in fact, we'd like to prove it using more or less the same kind of reasoning that we've shown here. So that involves figuring out how, what kind of invariance we can state and how we can prove correctness in separation logic of a system in which some bad components might be writing to certain locations, but only to certain locations, because virtual memory has restricted uh, where they can, which values they can change. Uh, and second, uh, so everything I've shown here assumed that the atomic operations are sequentially consistent, uh, but where concurrency really gets messy is when we have relaxed memory models. So there's lots of interesting work out there on concurrent separation logic for relaxed memory models, and we'd like to work on integrating that into VST and using it to verify some more uh, realistic programs using atomic memory accesses. All right, thank you. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Linda.